Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Sullivan. Let's stand together as we take our Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And we'll start at verse number 14. Acts chapter 13, verse number 14. We did the first 13 verses last week. And Sunday night as we go through the book of Acts here, we're discovering just some principles as we scroll through on why we're a New Testament local church, not a New Age local church. There's a big difference. And we want who we are to be based upon the Word of God. And as I get ready to preach, Mrs. Bell is due any time. And so as of this afternoon at about 3, I guess, I got a text from Brother Frank Bell that she, her contractions are 15 minutes apart. And she was on a bus today and sat all the way in the back to try and help those contractions. Well, they have subsided, I guess. Or are they there? Okay, so I'm going to do everything I can. They're 10 minutes apart right now. I'm going to do everything I can to preach that baby right out of her tonight. <laughs> so, so if you all have to get up, Frank, you just give me a thumbs up and I'll know why you're leaving and I'll shut it down right here, all right? And no, no, I, I am going to do everything. I, I'll stir that baby up a little bit, hopefully. <laughs> Acts chapter 13, and verse number 14 says, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in uh, Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers uh, of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. How incredible is it when those who have yet to believe say to a Baptist preacher or a Bible preacher, if you have anything to say, say on. Oh my, uh, praise the Lord. So get ready because we may talk on that tonight. Verse 16, then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. That's the title of the message tonight. Ye that fear God, give audience. That the, uh, that, uh, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an high arm brought uh, he them out of it. And about that, uh, the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. Verse 20, and after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, Yet desired they, Pilate, that he should be slain. Let's pray. Father, be with Brother Robinson as he sings once again tonight. I pray that you'd fill me with your power. Lord, you're such a loving and patient God. And I pray as I stand before your people that I would deliver your message. And I believe this is the message of the hour for our church tonight. I pray to be with other Baptist churches tonight who are having their evening services. I pray that you'd fill each preacher who will stand and herald the truths of God's word. Lord, may we do so with boldness. May we do so in righteousness. May we do so with the desire not to be heard of men because who we are, 
but a desire to please God. And Lord, I thank you for this great church and what you're doing here. If there be one that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior tonight, may tonight be the night of their salvation. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I wasn't there on the shores of Galilee when Jesus touched those blinded eyes and made them see. And though I did not see the empty grave that day, I still believe, for I know what Jesus did. shout as uh, one preacher said your wood must be wet how many remember the day you got saved all right right over here I need a man to stand up and just kind of testify about it for just a second now I don't want this sissified sharing either I want you to kind of just tell us what God did don't praise the devil but say I was lost in sin I was this I was this and then I met Jesus on this day or at this time and just don't, don't take the whole night but I want you you know what I'm talking about let's testify Baptist style brother Brittingham you ready stand and talk to us Yes, amen. How about right here? Who's going to keep going? All right, let's start with Brother Sparzak. Stan? Well, I'm a professional musician playing a rock and roll band for 15 years. And one Thursday night, a band of protection named Mitchell Bell came to my house and said, Brother, do you know the little boy? I thought I was involved in the church, but I thought I was saved. That's what we did. But he don't know what he got to that night, I knew, I knew, <laughs> and I got saved. And Come on. That Sunday morning, down at that altar, they sang as well. Amen. And that's something I will never, never forget. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Brother Hall, stand, turn that way so they can hear you. February 6, 1983, an old drunk got saved by two men who came to my door from the church. I had a wonderful wife. I had two wonderful children. I didn't think of what they are. Over, 
Come on, amen. Now the chairman of the deacon board and the assistant pastor, one of them of the Calvary Baptist Church. How about that? God is good. Over here, Brother McCain, come on now. Stand and talk to us. Amen. Uh, Brother Jimmy, I just saw you. Would you stand and just tell us what God did? Take us from, take us from the part that makes your wife cry, where she was raising children in a car by herself. Would you tell us that and, when you, and all that stuff? program was started out of the heart of that man right there. He came to me one, I believe, Sunday night and said, Pastor, we need to have something for the addicts. And we went up to Westminster uh, to Church of the Open Door and sat in an RUI clinic for two days together. And RUI was started here at Calvary Baptist Church. And praise the Lord for it. Who else? Come on, men. Uh, brother, uh, brother Dave Westbrook, go ahead, sir. Amen. Sitting right beside you, Will. Stand up. Come on. You got some testify in you. You got some preaching you, my brother. I remember the first time I met you right here, you weren't saved yet, and I scared you a little bit. Tell us about what God's done in your life bringing you to that point of salvation. Come on, amen. And uh, it's 
It's amazing what he's done in my life. I mean, I was, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I said to myself, what else is this man going to put me through? I've been through two marriages. i got three kids. I lost a job of 13 years that I had, you know, making good money. And uh, I'm like, what's, what else is going to happen to me? I lost my parents at the age of 11 years old to murder-suicide. And uh, a lot has happened in my life. And then I want to put in there that I started volunteering here. Yes, she did. And uh, I started out two days a week. <laughs> now I'm every day of the week. <laughs> I just see I see him. I just can't get away from here. I'm always here. <laughs> but I'm blessed with the wonderful people that God has put in my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Who's next? Brother Snipes, come on. <laughs> Because there's no hair on his head. <laughs> I was raised in a very, very religious home. I was raised Catholic, altar boy. I was six months from attending seminary in New York under Carver Sheehan. But unbeknownst to me, I had a grandmother who prayed for her grandson. She was a born again. Bible believes independent <laughs> fundamental Baptist out of Hickory, North Carolina. And she prayed for me to be a real preacher, a real man of God. And God intervened, and I spent a little time in the wilderness. I come from an alcoholic home. I became an alcoholic. But even though I heard the sounds of heaven all my life, April of 1989, at Emerson Baptist Church, come on. Dr. Bob French, taught me what it really meant to hear the voice of Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad because I could not imagine being a priest and not being able to be married to Ah, uh, come on now. <laughs> yes, amen. Praise the Lord. Who's next? Come on, we're taking time to just read that song. Got me all stirred up. Great song. Uh, Brother Bennett, right back here. Yes, sir. Well, I was raised in the mountains of West Virginia. Uh, my dad died when I was four. My mom and my mother liked his sister for several years, four of us. Uh, she started with the sun song. Right then in the mountains, they baptized people in the creek, the real creek. You know? uh, but anyway, but I remember she used to bring the kids home from Sunday school, you know, at the house. But something must have embedded in me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You have a testimony like I, not what God saved me from, but what God spared me from. And I thank God for that testimony. Brother Jim Isom. Frank Bell, I'm coming to you next, so get ready. God oh, bless you. Didn't take all night to tell you how I got here. <laughs> but it started out with uh, my mom died when I was just a little baby. And I was raised by different people. And I uh, tell you the truth, didn't nobody want me. That's what it seemed like anyway. So when I got to the age where I could go into the military, I went into the military. And then when I got out of there, my well, life really come apart then. And so I had to come up here, and I got hit in the back at Bethlehem Steel, and got messed up. And uh, I got to think about my life, boy, you wouldn't know I've been done that. I've got my wife, she's not ready to believe me, I couldn't work. 
Come on. You know, I didn't understand what happened to me, so when I went home, I didn't know how to tell my wife what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so it took me about three days before I finally told her, and she sat there and looked at me like I was nuts. I wasn't sure I was. <laughs> <laughs> but God's been good to me down through the years. He has pulled me out of so many messes. It's pitiful. But I think the most clear, vivid thing in my mind about what really brought me to salvation was in 1968, I got shot up pretty bad in a hump accident. And when he got me to the hospital, I spent nine hours being operated on. And it was 14 days later before I come to. And the doctor came in and he told me, he said, you're lucky. I'm going to tell you how lucky you are. You ought to go to church seven days a week and twice on Sunday, even if you're not religious. That's how close you come to die. And I remember that. And it stuck in my mind out there one night after I got saved for about two years. And I told Jack and him about it. It just hung there. I kept asking myself, what's going to happen if you die? Believe me, folks, if you die today, it's going to come so quick you won't know what to do. But God sure had to give me grace. That he did. I love him with all my heart. Amen. I try to serve him the best I can, but I'm getting too old now to get around. I'm trying to get down in the bottom. <laughs> in, 2000, in 2003, when the pastors here had to resign because of health, when Dr. Caldwell resigned, uh, Brother Bob Rolfe, the chairman of the deacon board, Brother uh, Bud Hall, got together and the church uh, brought a whole pulpit committee together. Brother Bob Rolfe was chairman of that pulpit committee. And while they were looking for somebody to lead the adult Sunday school class, I believe it was, they went to Brother Jim Isom and in the absence of a pastor, Brother Jim Isom stood just about every Sunday morning, opened the Bible and preached and taught the word of God to the people of Calvary Baptist Church. And it's an amazing thing what God can do with somebody. Brother Frank Bell. You're sitting beside the lady who uh, brought you to church and tell us that story if you would. Troy, I'm coming to you next. Yes, you did. <laughs> God bless you. Brother Troy, tell us what took you to that bridge that day in your life, please. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Sasser, stand and end it for us, would you please?
Amen. Stand with me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. We could have went all through tonight and had every man, every lady testify. But when's the last time you just said thank you? Would you sing it in four-part harmony with me, please? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making As you're seated, let's look at Acts chapter 13 again. The hand of God is now very evident upon the Apostle Paul's life. As a matter of fact, what started out as Barnabas and Saul is now Paul and Barnabas. And Paul becomes the spokesman of God, anointed by God as he stands before people all throughout that known world or the known Gentile world. Many marvel at who uh, he is versus who he was. And the transformation in the life of Paul was just staggering to some. For they knew that this was the man who was coming in and persecuting the churches and putting people to death because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now who he was was struck a chord in so many some of it was fear but some of it compelled them to listen now that Paul and Barnabas have departed from Perga uh, they come to Antioch and go to the synagogue after the reading of the law and after the reading of the prophets the ruler of the synagogue sent or said to Paul and Barnabas as he invites them to speak and said do you have anything to say to the people and as any preacher would Paul took the opportunity not to talk about himself but he took the opportunity to preach Christ. And as we look at this passage of Scripture, just for the next few moments tonight, we find in verses six, uh, 16 through 18, as we read, Then Paul stood up, and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. That God, or the God of this people of Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an high arm brought him, or brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. We find number one tonight the deliverance of the people of God. Paul first addresses the fact that God delivers the nation of Israel from the hand and the oppression of the Egyptians. And may I remind us tonight as a people what we've been delivered from. May we never forget the deliverance of God. That deliverance was brought on by His mercy and His love for all mankind that He would set us free from that sin which binds us knowing who the Israelites were. God still delivered them. You see, in Egypt, they complained about the oppressed lifestyle, but they also complained in the wilderness where God took 
took care of them, yet God still delivered them and blessed them. Though they had taken on many ungodly customs of Egypt, the Lord still wanted to deliver them. And may I say tonight, no matter who you are today, the Lord wishes to deliver you. He does not wish for you to stay the same, he, but, he does not, uh, but he does wish to deliver you from whatever it is that oppresses you tonight. May I show you here in this verse, verse 17, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high arm, he brought them out of it. And about the time of 40 years, suffered he their manners in the wilderness. What does that phrase mean? He gave them Canaan, even though the way they acted toward him in the wilderness was wrong. He suffered their manners. How, how many times does God just suffer with us? How many times does God just put up with us? We look at the complaining people in the wilderness, and I, I am often, my wife and I have talked, that we don't ever want to become complainers towards the things that God has bestowed upon us. But so many times as we sit there and we listen to, to couples and we, we listen to teenagers and we listen to children, how often do we hear the complaints of the people of God versus the praises of the people of God? We get so focused on ourselves. We get so focused on what we don't have or what we're not able to do that we fail to realize what we do have and what we still have opportunity to do. I may not be able to do all the things I used to be able to do, but I'm going to focus on all the things I still can do. And to our senior saints, be careful that you don't focus on all you can't do any longer, but focus on those things that you still can do for Christ. Some of our young adults, may you not focus on all the things that you used to do uh, in the world of sin and in the bondage of sin, but why don't you start focusing on the things that God has delivered you from and look at that greater purpose and say, God, if you'll use me, I'll let you tonight because I'm so grateful you delivered me. We find the deliverance of the people. We find number two, look at verse 19. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. Not only the deliverance of the people, but number two, we find the destruction of seven nations. The destruction of seven nations. We preached on those nations uh, through our Victorious Christian Life series. And we saw as they crossed over Jordan, they went to Jericho and to Ahai. And we went through all seven of those nations that God delivered into their hand. But you notice that word here in verse 19? He had destroyed. Destroyed. Every one of us, in order to obtain the Christian life, that victorious Christian life, every one of us have things that must be destroyed in our life. Amen. Some tonight are hindered from that joy in Christ because you have yet to destroy whatever it is that's a stronghold in your life tonight. You want to hold on to it because for some reason you're finding security in that sin or that, that separation that is dividing you and God. And may I say these seven cities were strongholds in the land of Canaan. They had to be defeated in order for Israel to have the land. And some of us tonight have strongholds. For some of you it's bitterness. We look so often at addiction as being uh, to alcohol or to drugs or pornography, but some of you are addicted to hatred tonight. Some of you are addicted to bitterness tonight. Some of you are addicted to hurt tonight. Some of you are addicted and you can put it in there. Nobody else would know because it's an addiction of the heart that you can hide from everybody else, but you cannot hide it from God. And that is something that needs to be destroyed and you've got to present it to God tonight Amen. if you want to have that victorious christian life there are some things in all of our life in all of our lives that have to be destroyed what is it what is it maybe it's serving god with strings attached you need to bring those spiritual scissors to the altar tonight and just kind of clip the apron strings that are holding you back maybe it's that computer tonight you have an addiction that nobody else would know about. You're on chat rooms or you're, you're, you're on the wrong websites, whatever it is. Then why don't you get rid of your internet tonight? Destroy it. Make it so you can't fall back on it. That's what destruction is. It's a complete annihilation. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. They look for it to this day. 
There's rumor as to where it is, but it was destroyed, and God said, I don't even want it rebuilt. Jericho was destroyed and said, Cursed be the man who'd rebuild it. And we look, and some of you, boy, there was a time when you destroyed it in your life, but you've allowed Satan to rebuild it in your life, and that's why you're struggling, because what God had destroyed, you have then rebuilt and constructed again. Get your life back for Christ. We find the destruction of the seven nations. Number three, as we move quickly tonight, look at verse 21, and afterward, they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. By the space of 40 years, we find the deliverance of the people, the destruction of seven nations. We find number three, the desire of a growing nation. The desire of a growing nation. I believe that King Saul was the people's desire, but David was the Lord's desire. I believe that God gave the people the desire of their heart when they wanted to be, if you read the Old Testament, like every other nation. And you know, it troubles me when we have saved believers, saved families who come to church faithfully, but yet you have the desire to imitate and be like the world. I, I struggle with that mindset. Now you say, well, you're the pastor. You don't have to. I have struggles. But the one thing I do not want to be is like the world. The one thing that I do not want to tolerate in my life is that blatant sin toward God. Now, I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect, but I don't want to choose sin. I don't want to choose those areas that will wrong the heart of God so deeply because I'm going there so I can be like the world. I want to be separate from the world. I want to stand for Jesus. We find the desire of a growing nation as they went to God. They went to Samuel and said, we want a king. We want a king. And God says, all right, I'll give you a king. And he gave them Saul. And for 40 years they had Saul. For 40 years. Do you know under Saul's leadership they saw a brief set of good times. But then they watched some arrogance set in. And they watched as Saul began to uh, do some spiritual things improperly. And God had told him, I want you to completely annihilate this nation. And when they came back from that battle, uh, Samuel said, Whoa, what here I, the bleeding of sheep in the background. And then when Samuel looked further, Saul had spared that king's life. And Samuel had to take that, that sword. And Samuel killed that king and cut him up in pieces. You see, God had told him, you need to destroy this. But Saul said, I've got different ideas. I've got a better way to accomplish God's will. And may I say, there is no better way than God's way to accomplish the will of God. Amen. It's got to be God's way. And they slaughtered those sheep, and Samuel looked at Saul. And from that day forward, the hand of God was lifted from Saul. Why? Because Saul chose not to follow after God. There was out in the countryside on a hill a young boy who had a harp that was just watching some sheep singing, penning down some words. And God said, there's a man after mine own heart. There's a man that loves me. And he sends Samuel. And as Samuel makes his way to the house of Jesse, he sees all the strapping boys that Jesse has. And he says, surely one of these boys will be the next king of Israel. For God's going to ordain him. And the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, no, he's not here. There's got to be another. And I just wonder if Samuel said to his heart, you've got to be kidding. Look at these boys. He says to Jesse, he's not here. Do you have another son? And Jesse said, well, yeah. I've got little boys. Nothing like his brothers. He's a little bit scrawny. He's of a reddish complexion. We believe he had some freckles. He said that he's out watching the sheep. And Samuel said, I'll wait. And Jesse sent a servant to go get David. And you know, as that little ruddy youth made his way into that house, probably stinking a little bit from being outdoors, from wrestling around with some of those sheep that he had to keep out of the briars and had to keep in line. The Spirit of the Lord said, Hey, Samuel, don't ever forget man looketh on the outward. But I look on the heart. You see, so many times we look for a politician who will stand who looks the part. 
but inwardly he's not the part. Do you know God looks through churches and he's not always looking for one who looks the part. He's looking for one who has that surrendered heart. And we find the desire of a growing nation. What's your desire tonight? Is your desire toward the things of the world, is your desire towards those things that you covet and you think would be of God? Or is your desire God? Is your desire just to please Him? You see, the desire of a growing nation, God said, I'll give it to you. But how often do we as a people not wait for the timing of God and we begin crying and whining? like the nation of Israel. And you know what? When they started crying and whining, they got Saul. And with Saul, they got some heartache. With Saul, they watched as the hand of God was lifted. Oh, for 450 years, they were under the rule of judges, some good judges, some bad judges. But Samuel, God had raised up, and Samuel helped keep a nation in line. And Samuel would preach to the people, and Samuel would come in, and he'd say, Thus saith the Lord. And they said, Samuel, we love you, but we want a king. And they whined and cried about it. And God said, all right, I'll give you the man that stands head and shoulders above everybody else. I'll give you a man who's he's a little bit uh, humble now. He's shy now. He's out looking for his daddy's mules. And, and I'm going I'm to show you he's hiding in the baggage. But I also want you to remember, Israel, that's your choice, not mine. My choice for you is 40 years from now. My choice for you is a little boy named David who I'm not only going to use to kill a giant, I'm not only going to use to, to uh, lead the nation, but I am going to cause my line to come from that king right there. That's why we needed David. Isn't it something that as you look at Saul, when Saul's kingship is done, his family is completely severed and done. But David was needed for the lineage of Christ. Because one day, the Lord will come back and sit on the throne of David, not Saul. They just didn't want to wait for God's timing. Forty years before God had the king for them, they said, we want a king. Wait for God's timing tonight. We hit on that a little bit this morning, but some of you are facing some things. You better just hold on for God's timing. Say, how do I know when, God, when it's God's timing? You will know. You'll know. Somebody asked me this week, Pastor, when will I know? I said, I don't know. You'll just know. You'll just know. And some of us who have waited, we understand that statement. You just know. And we find, as Paul says, ye that fear God, give audience. As he points out the deliverance of the people, the destruction of seven nations, the desire of a growing nation. And lastly, verse number 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired Pilate that he should be slain. We find, lastly, they were deaf to the teachings of God. They were deaf to the teachings of God. You see, the reading of the prophets every Sabbath should have helped them recognize the Savior when he came. The reading of the prophet Isaiah, the reading of the prophet Ezekiel, the reading of the prophet Zechariah, the reading of the prophets would have helped them recognize the Savior. But they were deaf to the teachings. Can I say to you, church, tonight, the preaching of the Word of God ought to help you recognize sin. It ought to help you recognize those slippery slopes that some of you have found yourself on. It ought to help you recognize the pitfalls that the devil has for you because the Word of God is a light that shines on our pathway. We only fall from God and the things of God when we're deaf to the teaching, reading, and preaching of God's Word. Why have you slipped away? Why are you backslidden? Because sometime in your Christian life, the Word of God has fallen on deaf ears. Won't you hear tonight? Won't you hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches? 
how many of us tonight are deaf to the preaching, teaching, and even leading of the Spirit of God. We know sin, and we know that God hates sin, yet we indulge in it. Tonight, may we not be deaf to the teaching of our Lord, but may we accept the challenge of revelation when John wrote, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Ye that fear God, give audience the deliverance. If you're saved, you've experienced it. If you're held in bondage again in sin, you haven't lost your salvation, but he's ready to deliver you all over again. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to deliver us, to forgive us of our sin, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We find the deliverance. We find the destruction. What is it in your life that stands between you and God? What is it that you know is wrong, but you just have a hard time getting rid of? Destroy it tonight. Number three, the desire. What's your desire? Their desire was to be like every other nation and have a king. Is your desire to be just like every other person, or is your desire to be like Christ? What's your desire tonight? And lastly, are you deaf tonight? Are you turning a deaf ear to the Word of God? The Bible that we're supposed to read every day of our life. Spiritual nourishment for a spiritual life. Are you deaf to it tonight? Are you deaf to the preaching? Do you sit here and say, well, I enjoy going to church, but that's just not for me. That's for everybody else. Are you deaf to the working of the Holy Spirit tonight? That still small voice that is whispering into your heart right now? Pride keeps you from coming forward. Humility will kind of push you out of the pew and say, go on down there and talk to me for a minute. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Ye that fear God, give audience. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, if I died this evening, I don't even know for sure that I'm saved. If I died tonight, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. But Pastor, I'd like to know. Is there anybody like that tonight? You'd raise your hand, anybody at all? Pastor, I don't know if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I'd like to know that. Pastor, would you please pray for me? I'm the only one looking. Would you just slip your hand up? Is there anybody like that tonight? By our testimony, we're all saved. Ye that fear God, give audience. He says, hey, give, give me your attention for a minute, Paul said. Do you have a fear of God? Then listen to God. I don't know what God's doing in your heart, but many have come already tonight. Let's get back to this thing of just serving God because he's worthy. He's worthy. And he wants you and he wants me. Will you surrender? Father, please bless this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand together, the piano's playing tonight. Won't you come? Step out, please. Let's use this altar. Teenager, God wants you. Parent, God wants you. Grandparent, God wants you. Ye that fear God, ye believe in God, he is able to do what he said he will do, both for righteousness and unrighteousness. Would you just come down and say, God, I need to get some things right, so here I am. Here I am. Thank you for your deliverance in my life, God. Help me destroy these strongholds that are in my life, God. Lord, help me never to turn a deaf ear to the things of God. And Lord, help me to desire the things that you would desire for me. As folks pray this evening, won't you there in your pew pray with them, please?
still plenty of time to come down and pray, make a decision. If you need to get saved, there's altar workers. It's a great message. Don't go without being changed and making a decision at the altar. Thank you so much for the message that we heard tonight. Father, help us to be delivered from the things in our life that are strongholds so that we can do more for you. Thank you so much for the decisions that were made today. Father, what a great day. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for everything that you've done. Baptistry water stirred over and over again, and we don't take that for granted. And yet, once again tonight, we thank you so much, Father, for everything you've done. In your name, amen. You may be seated. As you're seated. The ushers are making their way forward right now, and as they do so, we're going to take a love offering for this beast feast. So ushers are quickly making their way down to the front, but don't have a heart attack in the process. Y'all come, give people time to reach for something. Drop it in if you would, please, as the piano plays, and then Brother Jerry will lead you in a song. Daniel will be back over here on this side. I'd like for you, if you would, call our councilman and just talk to him and just say, hey, I just want to say as a concerned citizen that I'm against this transgender bill that they vote on, I believe, tomorrow night, if I'm not mistaken. Leave a voicemail. He has those numbers, and so please see him. I think we ought to call, but I think we ought to call and be kind as we voice our concern. And so please do that. Get those numbers from him in just a minute after uh, I baptize. And here she is. After I baptize men, we have the Beast Feast meeting. It'll be about five minutes only. We're just going to go over a couple things, see where everybody's at. Leah, this is Cindy Cordella's granddaughter here, am I right? And Leah, did you ask Jesus Christ to save you? I'm glad you did. I'm going to set you down for a second, okay? Upon your profession of faith, my dear little sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in likes of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Uh, praise the Lord. Let's stand together. Brother Daniel Anderson is going to be right over here, and he's making his way over right now to get the school set up. Don't forget, no school tomorrow. It's not snowing or anything, is it? No? We're good. Praise the Lord. Brother Troy has asked the men to take your families home if you wish, and then come on back and meet he and his son here at the altar. I thank you for your prayers. I mean that. I'll be back Wednesday night to give you an update on what God's doing. Men with the Beast Feast, head that way. I love you folks. Have a great night. You are dismissed.